Welcome to another edition of Sean Anthony Live. And of course, I'm your host, Sean Anthony. Joining me next on the program, someone that has been making his mark in Columbus, Ohio for quite some time on the music scene, hip hop primarily, studio owner, engineer, and recording artist, Ty Wills. What's happening, man? What's up, brother? Welcome to the welcome to the show, man. Hey, man, thanks for having me, man. You know, me and DJ Con Artist was talking uh, prior to this interview. I was like, man, I swear I, I met this brother before, you know, and, and you've been doing your thing for a long time. And I, of course, I moved away from some time. Do you have any early recollections of when we, we ran into each other back in okay, the day? Okay, so what, what year did you move away? I left to go to Detroit in 05, 2005. Okay, so I moved here uh, right after um, 9-11. Okay. And I was putting the mixtapes out and ended up getting the deal in 2002. Okay. So we crossed paths between 2002 in 2005. So let me ask you this. Did I play your music on, yes. on, on the show? Yeah. So I had, a, um, I had a song, went eight weeks on the Kiss of the Diss It. Okay, it was right. called uh, Donkey. Okay. Then I had a song called okay. uh, uh, Beating at the Block on Chrome. Okay. I, with I, a little I, flip. And that was around 04, 05. Okay. I think I remember that now. Because, you know... Uh, I made it a point having that platform on Power 107.5 of breaking artists yeah. in, in the city. And that, that okay, that makes sense now. I was like, that name sounds familiar, but I just couldn't put my finger on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But granted, yeah. It's, and it And it was, and, and, and I think back then, it was supposed to be, if you went eight weeks, you, you were supposed retired. to uh, go in rotation. Oh, I don't yeah, know about man. that. But y'all, ain't, but y'all didn't do it, man. So I'm here to I'm here to air out the beef right now from 20 years ago. See, what's your name again? <laughs> <laughs> nah, man. So uh, let's talk about that. Let's start right there. How did that link up with Lil Flip? Because Lil Flip was popping back then. You know, how'd you get that? Okay, that, so that um, all right. So kind of kind of funny story. So basically. Um, I was recording. Uh, I, I actually recorded "Beating Block on Chrome" in two thousand and two, and when I first did it, uh, or, or let me see, was it two thousand and three, something like that? So when I first did it, uh, they used to have open mics at the aquarium oh, wow. on Hamilton Road. I remember the aquarium, and I go perform it, and it just seemed so slow. Nobody was even reacting to it. I was like, man, I'm never doing this song again. Mm-hmm. So then fast forward, 2004, I opened up my own studio. My first studio, it was in the basement. So I'm selling CDs at the gas station on Allen Creek and Livingston. Okay. I'm- and uh, this dude pulls up and he buys a CD. Then he brings back, uh, remember Lil Wayne's uh, group, Squad Up? Squad Up, yeah. He brings back Super Blanco from Squad Up. Mm-hmm. And he was like, yeah, man, who recorded this? And I said, well, shit, I, I recorded it. Right. So when they come to the studio... I'm just, uh, you know what I'm saying? Because they bought the album, I'm playing them songs. Every song I play, they like, man, let us get on this. Let us, you know what I'm saying? Let, let us, um, let us um, 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 hop on that. Get a feature. So basically, uh, they got on it. It started bubbling. Little Flip hears the song. Sends a verse over the song. He gets the instrumental. Then he lays the track down. So now it's me, Super Blanco, and Little Flip. I got to stop you real quick. When you say send verse, we wasn't doing emails back then. Heavy. No, so this dude rapped over the song. How did he send it to you? So he rapped over the song, and, and I, didn't, I didn't hear that part because like nobody had the instrumental. Okay. So he wrote his verse to the actual song. Oh, wow. Then we got in the instrumental, then he laid his verse down. And then it was me, him, and Super Blanco. And then about a couple months later, they just wanted to buy the song. So I end up taking my verse off, but uh, but I stayed on the hook. That's dope. And it was just like that. And it's funny because Flip says in the verse, he charged 40000 for a feature. 
but I got the feature for free. How about that? Dope. <laughs> and he actually paid you for the song, right? So somebody else paid for the song. Okay. Yeah. So like I didn't uh I ain't meet Flip until uh um years later. Damn. When it came to that. So he yeah. he didn't heard your music. You produced it, right? Did yeah, you produce my that? dude CJ made the beat. Okay. I recorded it, came up, you know, wrote everything, stuff like that. Yeah. And it's funny too because uh And he didn't even meet you. So look, check this out. In 2002, when I had first got my first deal, in the middle of that, uh, remember Tony Draper from Suave House? Mm -hmm. He wanted never, to never sign met him, me. but, but okay, so he wanted to sign me. So in the middle, I signed in June 2002, October 2002. Tony Draper flew me out, and he like, yeah, man, I'm gonna put you on Houston. Da 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 da. Your first single single is gonna be with Little Flip, but we never end up coming to agreement with the deal. Plus I was already in the contract. Mm. But then years later, you know, two or three years later, I ended up doing the song with him anyway. So, that, so that's kind of crazy. So what, what, why didn't that, what happened? How did that fall through? What, Tony Draper? Yeah. Okay, so. Um, that, Cause that's gotta be disappointing, man. You you know, that's that's a legendary uh, label and, and, and what they do in Houston is big. Everything in Texas is, is big. And you gotta think, this is right before Houston started popping in 04. Remember when Mike Jones came out? It was bubbling well, well, 04, well, 05. nationally, but, yeah, yeah, but yeah, right yeah. there, they, they pop and oh, make yeah, money. Yeah, yeah, you know yeah, what yeah. I'm saying? But the world, so, so, um, so then how that whole thing happened was I did a remix to, was a David Banner song or something like that. So, so, so somehow Tony Draper heard this song and his homeboy called me. And he like, yeah, man, Draper want to holler at you. You know, of course, I don't think it's real. And like, I've never been on an airplane before. Oh, wow. So I'm on the phone like, hey man, I ain't never flew an airplane. I'm, I'm scared. I got to bring somebody with me. Yeah. So not only does he buy me a ticket, he buys my homeboy a ticket. We fly out there and we supposed to stay like two days, end up staying like nine. Wow. And it was just a wild experience, man. It was crazy. From the, from the first day off the plane, Party it, crazy, man. Look, man. Partying back then, man. We shh. this is this is beyond party. I'm talking about okay. this is crazy, man. Okay, crazy. I don't even want to get into it on here, bro. Is, is it taco parties, <laughs> Hollywood, it, Hollywood mansion parties? Man, I'm gonna just say this. So, <laughs> so we get to the airport, just like on TV. It's a man there holding the sign up. We get in the car. Me and my homeboy Dane. We go to the hotel. Draper comes swoop us up. And you know what I'm saying? And then you know say everything cool. So we pull up to this place that's pitch black dark. Wow. So we walk in. I'm like, oh man, this is crazy. So I'm like, everything is dark and it just has modeling agency on it. <laughs> so we in this giant room, man, sitting on this couch. Somebody turned some lights on. And I don't know if he clapped his hands <laughs> or snapped his fingers. <laughs> At least. 17 women came out oh, wow. from behind of a curtain, man. Just like on TV. Yeah. And he was just like, hey, man, pick what you want. <laughs> and me being, what, 22? Man, I just started laughing. <laughs> I couldn't even believe it. And then I go, you know, the rest is history. Right. But it was wild, man. So from one day, yeah. end up staying nine. And then um, when I got back, the label I was with, I guess they wanted him to kind of go in on like a joint venture. Mm -hmm. But he was like, I don't need to partner up with nobody. And they just didn't let me go at the time. Really? So of course in that moment I was devastated, man. Cause like, you know, when you rap your whole life mm -hmm. and you got this dream and you feel like here the opportunity is and somebody is like, no. Mm -hmm. Cause like the label I was with at the time, I just met these people. Okay. And I was probably signed, you know what I'm saying? July to October, so it went that long. So it ain't like nobody had like discovered me, dusted me off and developed me. I was already, who I was. Right. And, um, but I think, uh, you know, everything happened for a reason. Can you say what the label, what, what label? Well, the label's not a label. What, 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 so the label was, <clears throat> they're in the label now and distribution was through uh, Warner Brothers. Okay. So, um, but yeah, but it's all good now. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I look at it totally different now. You, you look at it as lessons learned? Well, I look at it like, sometimes when you in it, you can't see, right? So at first I'm like, I rap, this is an opportunity, I'm supposed to do this. Mm -hmm. So when I got signed, 
the first thing they did was put me in the studio. Now I've been rapping studio forever, but I never operated a studio, you know, Pro Tools, none of that stuff. So for the first year, I'm in the studio every day. I basically taught myself how to do Pro Tools. Okay. And from that is the lesson I learned that has saved my life now. See, if I was there rapping and got signed, who knows what would have happened? You know what I'm saying? I didn't know nothing about the business like that or nothing. So sometimes when you in it, you just sad and mad and, and like, all, you know what I'm saying? Oh, man, they hating on me. Oh, they stopping my career. Mm-hmm. But I look back at it now and that was nothing but a blessing. That was supposed to happen. Because mm-hmm. I'd have probably signed a bad deal, came out, didn't do nothing, and then wouldn't know nothing. Yeah. So, you know. So uh, you, 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 you learned some lessons through that process. Then fast forward, you started continuously dropping music. Yeah, so I was selling, uh, so I always been selling stuff my whole life. Okay. Um, when I was real young, the first thing I, I ever wanted to be was a cartoonist. Okay. And I loved drawing, and then I was able to draw a cartoon one time and then memorize it and draw from like four or five angles. Hmm. So in third grade, I was actually selling drawings. I would uh, go buy a comic book, the plastic that the comic book come in. Mm-hmm. It was this dude that was selling me just the plastics. I would take my paper, fold it up to slide into the plastic, draw the picture with colored pencils and was selling it in school for like 25 cents. And I had a jar full of change in my desk. So that's the earliest of me selling anything. Any kind of art. Yeah, yeah basically. So then to fast forward to, you know what I'm saying, when the CDs came out and selling my music, the first CD I ever sold, it was, uh, I had bought one of the first standalone CD burners. They was like $800. Mm-hmm. You put the blanket one side mm-hmm. and the other side only went four times the speed. So it took me like, Three hours to burn 100 CDs. Right. And I went out uh, 1999, New Year's Eve, turning in, into into 2000. And I had sold 100 CDs for 10 bucks a piece and made $1,000. And I couldn't believe it. Yeah. And it was just on from there. Where, where was this at? Because you said you moved here after That was 9/11. in Toledo. Okay, you're from yeah, Toledo. Yeah, yeah, from Toledo. Okay. So when I moved here... I'd already been rapping. I'd already uh, been doing shows crazy. Like in high school, man, I was uh, with uh, my homeboy, CJ Mack. He had a uh, he had a deal. And, and like um, we was on tour with like, he sings. So we was on tour with like Boys the Men in high school. Okay. Uh, Gerald Levert. Uh, we did some shows, uh, you, know, you know, all over the place. So I already knew about the music. But when I moved here, of course, didn't nobody know me. Mm-hmm. So what I started doing was I was selling my CDs for $1. And people was kind of laughing at that, like, oh, it's a dollar, oh, it must be whack or whatever. Mm-hmm. But what they didn't understand was I was selling two or 300 a day. So the first six months of me living in Columbus, I went to every club and never walked inside. You just stood outside? Stood outside. Hustled the CDs? From 10 to two in the morning selling these CDs. That's dope. Then I went to the gas station and I realized Thousands of people go to a gas station every day. All day. So from 3 p.m. after school to about 6 after work, I was making $300 a day standing in one spot. Wow. While the people working in there got a name tag on, shirt tucked in, uniform, making $7. And that's how I got my buzz up. That's how I built my studio. And I just did it like that. That's admirable, man. That's very <laughs> admirable. Um you know, I wish that that young people could see um, how hard work, you know, definitely play, pays off. So let's fast forward, man. Okay. You you run your own studio now. Yep. You, you have your own studio. Tell everybody what's what's the name of it, and how did that? How did you transition from being an artist? Not saying that you're not an artist anymore, but running a, a business now. Okay, so my studios called Stay B Studios, um, and like I said, uh, so how I took the studio leap was. So when the Draper deal didn't go down, right, my label sat me down, was like, look, man, give us a chance. We got your best interest. You don't know those people. So this is this is November 2002. Mm-hmm. So they was like, give us a chance. Trust us. November 2003, they was like, we're done. Say that to you. We're done with the music. They had like a... 
So what I remember is kind of, they gave somebody in LA $150,000, something like that. Mm -hmm. And I was supposed to do this song with Nelly at the time or St. Louis Hicks or something, some compilation, and dude just kind of ran off with the money. Oh, wow. So that was such a devastating blow. They was like, we're done. Yeah. So November, 03, they like, so at the time, I'm also living with them. So they like, you got to get out by January. Damn. So if you, so I worked my entire life. When you get two years to live a dream, ain't no going back to work. Mm -hmm. I've already had a taste of that what freedom. it's like just to live That's, out. That freedom. What you want. So January came, had no money, of course. I'm selling mixtapes and um, I go to Guitar Center and I price everything they got in that studio I was at. And it came up to about $4,500. Mm -hmm. And from January to August, it took me to save up that money. I was doing shows every week. That's how, that's how I was, I was uh, paying my rent. Winning the, winning the talent shows. Mm -hmm. And I'm selling CDs every day. And this is all around Columbus. This is all around Columbus. That's dope, man. And then August, um, I got the equipment sitting in my living room. So now I'm like, I got to find somewhere to build it. So I end up meeting this white dude. He had a crib. He couldn't afford the bills and he kind of rapped a little bit. So I'm like, look, let me move in, build a studio. I pay half the bills. And September 24th, 2004, Stay B Studios was open in the basement. And Without never running the business, none. All I told myself is, hey, rent due in 30 days. <laughs> so by November, I had Busy Bone in my basement, Chris and Neef in my basement, Cadillac Tile in my basement, Black Child in my basement. Uh, you know, I was recording Jewel Santana. So, you know, squad up. So it was just a blessing, man. But that's exactly how I started. That's crazy. Just like that. How did how did those names start to recognize to come to your studio? So I have no idea. Okay. <laughs> so 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 when I open the studio up, now I'm like, okay, cool. How do I get clients? Because I don't know nothing about running no business. Did, did I ever go to your? Have I ever been to your studio? Maybe in the in the basement. It was out east. Out east, where? I mean, you guys uh, give the exact location, but the uh, general. Uh, it was by um, what was that street? It was by that school, uh, Waverly, Livingston area. Oh, uh, Eastmore. No, it was a, it was a junior high school. Where is that? Um, okay, but I, I get what you're saying. Yeah. Uh, and, um, was it called Stay Beat back then? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I I just remember because I don't know if you know my background, but what got me into radio was hip hop and music. I was an artist, a rapper, a producer. Oh, you used to rap? Yeah. Okay. I was spitting that mad fire, son. That's what's up, man. <laughs> but I recorded with, with, with a few um, a few people in Columbus. Okay. Um, and I just remember recording a song with, do you remember Chopping, Grant, Chopping Game? I think that's the name that they went by. I did a song with Chopping Game. Yeah, remember? I remember that name. <clears throat> and I remember going to a studio and uh, it was in somebody's house and it was in the basement and it was really nice too but anyway that wasn't you so that wasn't yeah. your studio so um man that's amazing man let's let's fast forward now uh i'm a buckeye <laughs> how, how how did that take off you you got some notoriety in the city you know on another level yeah. right with that yeah so the buckeye song was uh it was produced uh by my homie artificial and um of course back then the way to get on the radio was to do a Buckeye song. And um, of course, Ram had the classic Buckeye song. Yeah. And then- Shout um, out to Ram Diggy. So, so at the time, we like, cool, get a Buckeye song, you get on the radio. So we did the Buckeye song. Uh, Hold on, that's just tripping me out real quick. That, 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 was, that, that was the word around town is that- Oh, yeah. If you want to get on the radio, you got to do a Buckeye song. Yes. You know, I broke that record. That, that was all me. That's what's up. Yeah. Yeah, so like, you know what I'm saying? In the, in the streets at the time, that was like the only local song really playing. Mm -hmm. I, you know what I'm saying? In 05, my song got on there in 05, but this is like 
2002, 03, you know, 04 time. So the word was a Buckeye song was away on the radio. Yeah. And that's and, exactly and, why and we let did Let me it. just say this for the record. Any local song that was heard on the radio in the early 2000s, I pushed that button. Hey, bro, that, that, that was me. Appreciate that, and, man. But, but it's, I'm, I'm not saying that for for clout. I'm saying that, look, I'm a part of this 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 hip-hop history in Columbus. If, if it was no All Night Flavor show, no Kiss It or Diss It, it was, you know, there was no other hip-hop station in Columbus. Power 107.5 was the only hip-hop station. This is before 106.7 to yeah. be, and all of that, you know what I'm saying? And we had a tremendous run. Uh, me, Paul Strong, Von Roy G, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying, during that time. Um, but yeah, I just had to say that, man. Yeah, man. So that's how the song came about. We literally did it. Because at the, at, the, at the time, man, I didn't even know nothing about football. <laughs> nothing about football. I had just recently found out how many players was on the field. So I'm looking like, hey, I'm trying to get on the radio. So we did the song, and it was catchy, and it popped, and yeah. people felt it, man. That's dope, man. Um, so when you had Busy Bone coming in the studio, you know, squad up, Jewel Santana, we all know, um, Cameron and the Dipset had mm -hmm. their run in Columbus. They used to get it in Ohio. Mm -hmm. um, what kind of rapport did you build with those people? Do you still have those relationships to this day? Um, what was the energy like back then? So back then, a lot of a lot of my clients, a lot of artists, they were kind of like, "Man, why don't you tell them you rap? Why don't you rap your songs to them?" And like, it was just something uh, off the rip with me was like. I'd rather have a business relationship. Cause like, you gotta think these artists was paying me to record. So I just kind of felt like people rapping in the ear all day and they already looking at me at a different angle. So I always kept a business relationship. So I never really, I wouldn't really trip on it. Like uh, first time I recorded busy, he came um, 14 days in a row. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So it was just like, it became like uh, a relationship on a more of a business type of level like that versus like me fanning out right. type of thing. Yeah. And then, you know what I'm saying? And, and, you know what I'm saying? And since then, I didn't work with artists, you know what I'm saying? Well, you know what I'm saying? Even, you know, even more or even bigger than back then now. But yeah, I, I was just... It was just cool to me. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? What what kind of... Uh, I've been in the studio with, with Busy before, um, and it, it, he he's he's talented as hell, man. Um, crazy talented. Crazy talented. And um, yeah, it blew my mind because this was early... Uh, this was probably early 2000s when, when I was uh, uh, in the studio with him. But just to see an artist at that caliber like Busy or Jewel's their work ethic behind the scenes, what it takes to put put together in a Man, song. Man, Busy, Busy Bone was so crazy. It's the first person I've never seen run out of breath. Hmm. He would get in there and just rap. Not taking, not breathing, not doing nothing. It was just, it was insane. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Because you know what I'm saying? Growing up, you know, watching Bone on TV and all this and then getting to see it in real life, it was just crazy. So when did you... Did you push the, the music back? I mean, obviously you kept putting projects out, but I'm sure as, as things started to pick up on the business side okay. with the studio, okay, so how did you balance? So when I first started, it was like, say like, I'm rapping here and it's the studio. And then it just started going like this. Mm -hmm. So I got to a point where I was like, so like now I feel like when you build something and people rely on you, you got a responsibility just like when I was growing up, 15, 16, 13 years old, rapping in the studio, if the person I was going to quit, close down, start doing something else, ain't no telling how that would have affected me. You know what I'm saying? I might have stopped. Mm -hmm. I might have gave up, stopped believing. So it got to a point where the music was popping. But the studio, so many people relied on me to get their dream off the ground. And then after, you know, after years, I just, I was like, you know, you know, cause you always battle with that. Am I quitting? Mm -hmm. You feel me? Am I giving up? Right. So 
I was like, I did everything a rapper did. I had a record deal. I make a living off music. I did shows, been on the radio, sold music. I've did it. And then my dream just evolved. Mm -hmm. So it ain't that I quit. I fell in love with the business. You know, it's interesting you saying that because I, I can take a page from that. I could definitely relate because like I told you, what, what got me into radio was my love and passion for music. And, you know, I've been playing, I was playing the piano as a kid, took piano lessons and mm -hmm. everything. Then in high school, I'm, I'm rapping and doing, going to talent shows, winning battles and freestyle fanatic, nice. hook up with a group, a band. We performing, do, opening up on shows and stuff like that. And the year I got hired, the, the same week I got hired on Power 107.5 was the same week I got hired as an engineer because I went to school for audio engineering. Oh, nice. And like, I'm thinking I'm going to be this producer and this hip hop artist. That that was my my goal. So I'm working as an engineer at a local re recording studio here in Columbus. And I'm working uh, as an on-air personality part-time on Power 107.5. Oh. And same thing like you, my radio career, they kept calling me. My radio career started taking off and my studio sessions, you know, it wasn't moving as fast enough. Mm -hmm. So I had to figure out which one is going to bring me the money, you know, at the time, because I had, I had a, a child to provide for, you know what I'm saying? So fast forward, my radio career took off. And then I was like, you know what? I didn't necessarily stop rocking the mic. I'm just rocking the mic in a different way. You see exactly. what I'm saying? Exactly. So I can definitely uh, understand that. Now let's 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 pivot real quick um, into something a little bit more personal. You you've had some challenges in your life. You 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 comfortable talking about that with you being shot? Oh yeah yeah yeah. That's funny because I, I never really really uh, spoke about this. Um, when was that, and and how did that happen? So 2005. This is in the height of, like I said. Studio opening 04, September. I got shot before the studio even was one year old. So song was taking off, doing shows, and uh, I definitely got set up. It was not no, nobody from the studio. So, I mean, you know what I'm saying? And it was just like a, let me see, man. It was a. So funny thing is, I look at that moment in life, believe it or not, as positive. Because I, I believe this. I believe God sent you signs that you need to change. And if you don't heed them, hmm. then he make you change. Right. And I felt like the situation I was in when I first started the studio the place I was in was kind of a, it started to kind of be like a cancer, right? But I was like, man, ain't nobody going to stop me from making money. Ain't nobody going to stop me from being, you know, having my dream. And I was ignoring the signs because this is the first time I ever made my own money. Right. And at the time, I was just like, I ain't stopping this. But the place I was at, I needed to go. So I looked at getting shot as God's way of saying, you got to change because I'm not dead. I ain't paralyzed. I got a few back problems and the bullet's still in there. Wow. But even the people that did it, which I, you know, which I have no idea, but they could have killed me. Right. Right. They could have killed me, but they didn't. And I, I'm thankful for that. Yeah. And the fact that after that, Nothing but good things happened. So I don't even, I don't really rap about it. I don't talk about it like that. And it's crazy. Sometimes I forget it even happened. Really? But I look at this situation as such a positive thing now. Because that's the, that's the change I need to see. See, this is what I'm on the planet to do. No doubt about it. So everything with music it's going to work hmm. for me. I ain't never took a loss in music. So, and then part of my belief, right? So earlier I was talking, I was stuttering a little bit. So I got a real bad stuttering problem. I couldn't tell. Right. So over the years, rap has helped it. The first time I ever rapped 
was about fifth grade. And um, we had the news come to our school. They was doing a say no to cigarette campaign. At the time, my mom smoked cigarettes, which is one of the things that end up eventually killing her. She died in 2000. So I, so, so I hated it. So they said, does anybody sing a rap? So I was stuttering so bad at school, I wasn't even talking first, second, third grade. I was just quiet. And um, they was like, who raps or sings? And another kid raised their hand and I raised my hand. So the first kid rapped and he rapped um, the Humpty Dance. And even my mind back then, I was like, man, this nigga cheating. They ain't even the song. <laughs> right, right. So I just closed my eye. I just start saying stuff. It was not tight. <laughs> when I stopped, everybody started clapping. And they clapped because it was the first time I talked for a length of time and didn't stutter. Mm. And right then, because like I said earlier, I used to want to be a cartoonist, right? right? All my life, I wanted to do something that I was the ill as at. I was an ill cartoonist, but I knew two people in my school that was better than me. So I couldn't, I couldn't accept that. Then I love basketball, but it was a million people better than me in that. Mm -hmm. And when I rapped and did not stutter, and I didn't rap again until I heard Snoop Dogg. Okay. But when I started rapping, it was like, I already knew it. And because I never stuttered, I felt this is what I'm on the planet for. So fast forward, no matter what happened to me in the music, it's going to work. Hmm. And my entire life with this, people has been in my life, even if it's for a second, or years, it's been to help me on this path. That's why getting shot do not phase me wow. at all because a gun didn't save me. You know, so a lot of people are like, oh man, you going, you know, are you going out buying all kind of, kind of crazy guns now? A gun didn't save me. Mm -hmm. And one thing I learned about that, if a gun ain't glued to your hand right. and you don't know what's coming, sometimes a gun can make you a target. Right. Maybe if I was known for these crazy guns, maybe they would have just killed me off of it. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Right. But God saved me. So anything I do with the music is going to work. So there's no doubt or anything. So I don't even trip on none of that stuff, man. That's amazing, man. That's very inspiring. Um, sounds like you, you found out early on, maybe after that incident, or prior to it, that you know what your purpose is. I've been new. Yeah. So, what are you the, the illest at? You said it was you know cartoonist because it was rapping. 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 I'm on the planet for okay. it. It's funny because I don't really do it now. Right. That's what I was saying. So all is the it stuff it's now. Not, it's not engineering. The engineering. I, you know, I got a photography studio. I opened up next month to be my two year anniversary on that. Uh, on the twenty fourth of this month, it would be my nineteen anniversary for the studio. Wow. And I and I have a new studio open up January 2024 called Book the Booth. Okay. So, um rap is what I'm on the planet for. Right. I believe you know, and you know what I'm saying, you know what I'm saying rap to me is like it's a vehicle. Rap can get you around the places, mm -hmm. but you don't got to live in the car. Hmm. You can get out the car and do engineering do the radio, do photography, do that. But because I rapped and because I feel like, and this may sound crazy, but when a rapper does something, like even if, if photography, I'm not no trained photographer, mm -hmm. any of that, but I'm a natural creative person. Right. So I'm a rapper taking your pictures. It's a whole different mind state, state than maybe somebody that went to a class mm -hmm. or went to a school. Yeah. So because of rap and, the, the, you know, all the elements of like, you got to be a hustler. So you got to grind. You got to sell yourself. You got to be able to appeal to people. These are all things that you need in business. Mm -hmm. These are all things that you, you know, that you need in life, period. So I just feel like that's what I'm on the planet for. But I look at all of that as just music, you know, and art in total. That's dope, man. Um, is your um, your studio? It's located downtown, right? Right downtown. Yep. 
35 East Gay Street. Okay. 614-222-8900. That's what's up. <laughs> Um, you got a podcast, Stay Beat Studios presents Kick a Verse. Okay, so uh, I do these mic'd up. That's not a yeah, yeah, yeah. So like that's not a podcast. I do these series of videos, right? So uh I started this in 2019 called Kick a Verse, where I would take 10 artists together and put them on a song and everybody would kick a verse. And then it's been going on. So right now we just dropped the 2023 Kick a Verse, which is the all white cipher. So for a couple of years now, I had this idea of getting all white artists mm -hmm. and put them on a cipher. And I called it Right Power. Yeah. Right? So. I've seen some artists uh, put, putting some flyers out on social media about mm -hmm. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically, you know, just like anything else, I felt like white rappers also get put in the box. Yeah. And they get this stamp. And they get put in this category where like, uh, he rap, but he white. You know what I'm saying? So I just wanted to show some love to the white artists. And I was like, you know, I've never seen 10 white dudes rapping together. <laughs> I've never seen it. So I was like, that's clever, though. you know, why not do it? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So uh, it dropped Friday. So go to YouTube, Stay Beat TV. Y'all can check that out. Um, it's called Right Power and they killing it. That's dope. Man. I went and got a white producer, white rappers, and everything is dope. And you know, um, and then uh, we shot and edited the video. That's dope, man. Yeah, man. So um, before we conclude, man, let everybody know what type of uh, um, um, what what all you offer at your studios right now. Okay, so we offer, um, of course, the recording, mix, and mastering. Um, my new studio, which is called Book the Booth, it's kind of like a Imagine like an Airbnb studio, but you can't sleep in it. <laughs> okay. So I have a podcast room. I have a recording studio. All you got to do is bring your laptop and whatever recording program that you use now. Mm -hmm. We plug one cord in it and you tapped into the mic, speakers, interface, everything. So it's like, it's yours for however long you want it. A day, five, you know, five hours, eight hours. It's like a hotel room mm -hmm. with everything in it you <clears> need. So, you know, for, you know what I'm saying, for the up and coming people, you know, or the people, you know what I'm saying, like, um, I started off at the crib. So sometimes we get this twisted, like <clears throat> at the crib, you know, I may charge $25 an hour and it may be like, cool, I'm making money. But what people don't understand it's like, that's your electricity that you're using. Mm. That's your water that you're using. You know what I'm saying? Plus the home environment, in my opinion, eventually ends bad. Mm -hmm. Plus. Why? Because it's, at, because it's at the home. Right. And it's like, you know, even my studio, I ran it as if it was a building, but I still end up getting shot in it. And sometimes the mind, you know, all right, so first thing about the house is you can't bring everybody there. Right. So you automatically stunting your growth. And like I said, um, maybe you can charge more and offer more if you get out of there. But I get it. Everybody don't want to go out and get a lease, take that risk. You know what I'm saying? Everybody don't want to go out or got the money to buy all the equipment. And I've already done that. So all you got to do, bring your laptop to my spot. Now you don't got to follow nobody to the bathroom and make sure they ain't looking at your wife. Mm -hmm. Now you got to follow, you know what I'm saying? Now you got to worry about somebody stealing something. Mm -hmm. It's a, It's going to be a neutral meetup for producers, engineers, collaborations. I mean, you know what I'm saying? So, so, so basically, everything is kind of like that. So it's called Book the Booth. We also got a photography studio called The Boca Bodega, and it's kind of the same thing. I rent my photography studio out for $50 an hour or $100 a month. So, you, so if you up become a photographer, and you may not got the lights, you ain't got the space, it's winter, it's cold outside, it's rain, raining, needs somewhere to go. Mm -hmm. I got a full blown studio. Lights come with it. Everything's already there. All you gotta do is bring your camera and show up and go. Okay. So I just wanna provide these spaces for up and coming creative people, and they're all private. Mm -hmm. So once you book it, you know, you got a code for the door, it's just you in there. It ain't no shared space, nothing like that. Nice. So it's just a way to, you know what I'm saying, get your feet wet. <clears throat> And taking in more business mm -hmm. <clears throat> or getting your own place. This can be a spot. Like I said, I got a whole podcast room. So 
instead of somebody going out buying all the equipment, use it one time. Now I got cobwebs on it and dust. Mm-hmm. You can come to my spot and just see if you can, if you really want to do this, because because everything's already there for you. Right. Yeah, man. So that's clever. You, you it seems like you thought all of this out, man. And let me ask you this: Do you deal with uh, PTSD from being shot? Do you ha- deal with you know uh, anxiety and things like that? Man, you know what? I don't think so. I literally don't even think about it, man. And I, you know, it's like I said, maybe I don't even look at it like it's bad. Mm-hmm. But it sounds like the way that you have your studio set up, that maybe that event, um, uh, you know, kind of shaped the way that you well, for sure. created this. Well, for sure, this I was like, I can't be in a crib no more. Right, right. See, see, see it's funny because, and like this goes into... I'm going to say us as a people, right? I started off in the basement because I came from a basement. I never even thought I could ever get in the building. And simply because I'm a young black man, you know what I'm saying? This is my thought process. I didn't go to college. I didn't get no loan. I don't got no grant. So a building ain't no way in the hell they're going to let me in there. So even when I had my studio in the basement, I was thinking of, I need a bigger house. So now I can get two studios in the basement. My mind was still on basement. But then when I got shot, I was forced to think outside the box. And the first building I tried to get, I got it. Hmm. And that told me I could have been getting the building. But sometimes, man, the way we grow up, yeah, we got these boxes mm-hmm. that are there but we also voluntarily put ourselves, voluntarily put ourselves in the box. Yeah. So when I got shot, I was like, ain't no way in the hell I can go back to a crib. Mm-hmm. So I did get a building. I went downtown. And of course, everything is secure now. But you know what I'm saying? Cameras, locks, all that stuff. So the getting shot did be like, all right, man, I can't be in the crib. But as far as like, Anything else, not sleep in the night, you know, and stuff like that. Man, I just don't look at it that way. I truly look at it like a blessing because, see, man, sometimes, sometimes pain is a reminder of that you alive. Hmm. Somebody dead ain't feeling shit. Right. Somebody dead ain't got no problems. Right. Sometimes pain is I'm living still. Right. So, I don't look at it as anything crazy or the way people may think I look at it because mm-hmm. I'm not dead. Right. I know people that got shot in the leg and died. Wow. I'm not paralyzed. I'm not in a wheelchair. I'm still walking and talking. So it's like, whew. Yeah. And that's just how I look at it. That's dope, man. I, I definitely um, um, am, am excited that there's, there's uh, you you have a, a tremendous future ahead of you. You've created your own, you you created your own career, man. And that's admirable. You're an entrepreneur, you're a business owner, you're, you're, you've created a platform for other aspiring artists. Uh, any last minute words that you want uh, to send out there to those viewers out there about man. Ty Wills? Well, well, it ain't, re- it ain't even really about me. I just want to say, the planet is going to always need employees, but you may not always have a chance to take a chance on yourself. So what I want to say to people, bet on yourself. Have you ever put 40 hours into your dream? If you do, that may change your life. Like I said earlier about the CDs, I used to work at McDonald's. I, I worked at 9,000 McDonald's. I called off one day, and sold my CDs and made my check in a day and never went back to McDonald's. Hmm. So a lot of people just take the step, just take the faith. You know what I'm saying? Just have faith and just try it. Who knows? And a lot of times I feel like they say you could be anything you want. And I feel like sometimes trying something, you find out this ain't for you. (laughs) 
and you end up wasting a bunch of time. Yeah. So, man, take a chance on yourself. Believe in yourself. You only got one damn life. Yeah. And we all going to be dead soon. <laughs> so you might as well give yourself a try. There it is. Ty Wells. Y'all make sure y'all check this brother's uh, business out here in Columbus, Ohio. Stay Beat. Stay Beat Studios. Yep, Stay Beat Studios. Thank you for checking out another edition of Sean Anthony Live. Peace. Oh, Anthony,